this um this, this work with dads because i want to go into dads and then go into the visions values and purpose because again i think that ties in nicely so why specifically do you work with dads now i know the obvious question is because you're a male and you are a dad but was there any other reason why specifically working with dads yeah so for me the story would have been kind of coming out of sports or in a performance company where clients were were brought to me you know athletes say look you don't get to pick your your coaches you know they're like parents you just you just get lumbered with them basically so um what happened was around november last year on a saturday morning my my daughter was just screaming at me basically saying look it's, it's a saturday why are you not why are you not playing with me and i think at that point i was probably on my phone looking at linkedin trying to connect trying to message somebody and i just thought to myself look this isn't really what i signed up to do Welcome to the Prime Life Project podcast, a place to help you unlock your full potential, both mentally and physically, to become the best version of you. Welcome back to an episode of the Prime Life Project podcast, a place to help you both mentally and physically become the best version of yourself. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Lee Eldridge. How are we, Lee? Yeah, we're good, thanks. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Like I said, looking forward to this episode. Like I said, I say it's every single week, but the reason why I look forward to the episodes is because I actually do the research into the guests. So I do, I spend a whole week researching, so when it actually comes to it, I'm like an excited kid. So we're recording this, like this is your last day before you're, you're breaking up for Christmas. Uh, so we're, this is the build up to the festive period. So I literally feel like a kid. This is like, right, I've spent all week like building up to this and now I'm ready to roll. Um, so we're going to talk today about a topic I've not actually spoke about on uh, on the podcast before. I've spoken a lot about parenting, uh, but it normally comes from the, the woman's perspective. Um, but today we're going to talk about dads uh, and not just dads when it comes to parenting but specifically business dads and parenting so it's a completely new spin and slant on this topic so I also think it's going to be very interesting again if you are not a male listening to this because I think a lot of this stuff is going to apply to either parent whether it's the male or the female but can we just take a step back a bit and can we just talk about what moved you away from sports performance because that is your background you were very good you were very successful at that you worked with some amazing teams some amazing people so where did that sort of where did that path sort of change for you? So the path changed whereby I was in a professional sporting uh, team and my boss then was like, look, <clears throat> I'm not moving. If you want to, you need to kind of start reaching out and, and think about where your next step's going to be. So I put myself forward for a performance role based in motorsports out in Switzerland and for whatever reason didn't happen, but I still moved out to work for the performance company and they are like, hey, um, we want you to go and work on our corporate side. So I kind of made it the shift across um, from professional sports into maybe high performance business. So looking at C-suite individuals in, in, in big financial industries and organizations, not NGOs, et cetera. And naively, I thought to myself, oh, hey, this is going to be quite easy because we've gone from trying to maximize performance basically on the biggest stage we're trying to milk as much as we can out of that individual because the team wants it and then also the individual wants it for their for their own personal reasons to then going into a corporate situation where it's you know we're talking instead of maybe 50 people in a team we're talking 500 5000 people and that kind of really sparked my curiosity and I'd always been interested in in business and, and structures and how can we apply what we know from a sporting point of view into those business and that really kind of started that that drive basically to to be in that in that sphere mm. was it something that you were always interested in when it comes to the performance stuff anyway like did you want to i know you said you're interested in business but were you interested in working with like the, the the high-end performers in businesses or was it just more of like a you'd got to that crossroads in your career and you were like i want a new challenge i think that from my perspective in terms of the learning that I'd gone on. So I was very much right academic driven by knowledge, you know, about the human performance, human body, how can we get as much out? And then around 2011 working with an international athlete and his performance was just dipping and we didn't really understand why his training loads were the same. Everything was the same. And I built up a decent relationship with this individual. I bought and I was like, Hey mate, what's going on? And he was like, look, I'm about to go through a divorce. And I was like, right, that for me was the crowning moment where a lot of what happens on a on a pitch in terms of not only a training pitch, but, you know, come Saturday, Sunday is outside. So that mental space and that outside of 
kind of the sport is is really important to to increase that performance mm. and that kind of I was like right okay so then from that point of view to go through that process of looking into other areas and what happens is that you find that a lot of the the research is is around business for for that particular reason basically it's not sports kind of pushed so you know looking at like Tim Ferriss Daniel Gorman all those types of individuals that you know has heavily pushed towards business and for me I'd always had a little bit of entrepreneurism in my my head before coming into full-time you know I had a coaching business I was trying to get coaching hours I was trying to market that kind of stuff so there was always that kind of itch to see what business is like Mm. from the inside point of view so I think it's really interesting because that's kind of my journey when it comes to my, my background is fat loss specifically. And then once I kind of figured out that what you do in the gym and when it comes to nutrition, yes, you can tell people what to do, but actually all the other factors in their life, as you said, if they're stressed at work or they're going through a divorce or something, that's going to massively impact what actually happens when it comes to the fat loss and the results they're getting. So although it's not like a performance base, it's where you get paid hundreds of thousands and you're performing in front of fans. Actually, when it comes to your life, it's all related and people don't really connect the dots. So how was that transition then for you? What crossovers did you find from the um, sports performance world to these high-end CEOs? Because I imagine that there is obviously a lot of differences, but I imagine there's a lot of similarities as well. Yeah, so the difference is probably from a, a sports performance point of view is that really it's down to one thing. It's down to that performance on a on a weekday. Oh, sorry, on a weekend. But from a, a CEO point of view, there's there's thousands upon thousands of decisions to be made. Whereas with an athlete, what we're trying to actually do is remove the decision-making. So allow the decision-making only to happen from a game point of view. So, you know, the week would be heavily structured. The week would be heavily controlled. You know, if you were my athlete, I could pretty much say what you were going to be doing in four weeks on Tuesday morning, probably the exercise, probably the amount of load you're trying to move, et cetera. Whereas if you speak to a CEO, what are they doing in four weeks time? you know, that change, that changes. So what I had to develop was a way and a method of being very flexible in my approach, because we could be setting up and we could be working on something, for example, and then, you know, that CEO has got to fly for China and everything gets blown out the window, meetings get cancelled. We planned lots of different things and, and that would change completely. Mm. So then it was a case of educating that individual around uh, principles not necessary methods and that's that's the biggest kind of area that we need to look at is you know we don't want to be method driven we want to be principle driven because let's say for example you know right we you know, we're looking at kind of some form of physical activity in terms of strength based training right you're working you've got a home gym a lot of these people are working with have their own gyms then they start to travel and then they haven't got a gym they're like well we can't do that method of training and I'm like well no but the principle is that we need some form of strength work in you during the course of the week so right can we do some body weight stuff can you take bands in your suitcase can you make sure that your assistant always books a hotel with a gym those types of things likewise in terms of nutrition is developing principles around that as opposed to we've got to stick to a diet this is what you've got to do um and that kind of built on it in terms of right <clears throat> trying to be as flexible as possible because day-to-day life just changes heavily and one one of the biggest kind of learnings i suppose we we're walking across the pitch and i was talking to an athlete and this athlete had been in amazing different environments and he said the best coaches are what we call proactive reactives and i was like what do you mean by that well we are proactively always working on something you know a core a core foundation whatever you want to call it to enable us to be reactive if we need to change. Mm. Whereas most people, when I start to work with them, are reactive, reactive. So they're just reacting, reacting, reacting. You know, they're chopping and changing from from everything, basically, from morning routines, exercise patterns, diets. No one really knows what what's sticking, basically. There's a lot to unpick here. So I want to try Sorry. and this. But no, 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 this is this is awesome. I, I love this. I'd much rather have too much to unpick here, but I, I love this because there's loads of different paths I can go with this. I think the biggest one to go back to is decisions. So you mentioned the difference here is obviously with CEOs, they've got loads of decisions to make. Whereas when it comes to the athletes, got to try and remove the decisions. I feel like a lot of people struggle to make decisions. So let's just get rid of the the the, the CEO perspective. Just in general life, 
people struggle to make decisions. How do you help people make decisions with the unknown? Because as you've said, business people, there's a lot of unknowns, yet a lot of decisions have to be made. How do you help people manage that? Because that is a massive skill. I think a lot of people are unaware of um, the impact it has on their life, that decision-making element. So the the foundational thinking would be kind of ver- control versus influence. So we kind of speak about, or, or lots of people speak about, right, control, control, control. Now, realistically, especially like from a stoic point of view, what can we truly contr- control? Um, you know, though we like to control our body, you know, unfortunately, people who are really healthy still get really sick. It's just, you know, it's some things are just unexplainable. Likewise, from a from a mental point of view, you know, what can we really control? But for me, it's like, right, what can you go and influence? Well, I can influence my health, I can influence my thoughts, I can influence everything about me. And when it comes back down to decision making, lots of people are trying to control things that are uncontrollable. So take those decisions out. You know, I can't control your thoughts about what you think about me, but I can try to influence you as best possible. Mm -hmm. Then the next step back would be like, right, what's what's kind of your I know this is, you know, your visions, values and purpose, basically. So are the decisions you're making pushing you towards your vision are they in line with your values and ultimately do they feed into your purpose Mm -hmm. and once you understand that you kind of realize that no it's not it's not a negative it's a huge positive it it identifies that you are on a clear path you you know where you're going to go you're you're kind of planning out where you want to be and how you want to be because Mm -hmm. ultimately if you say yes to something you automatically say no to something else. And nine times out of 10, you don't get to pick what that no is. Whether, right, yes, I'm going to do that means no, I'm not going to spend so much time with my kids in this evening. Or yes, I'm going to do that, which means no, I'm not going to be able to go to the gym or train or whatever it might be. Mm. And you don't get to pick. I love that. And it, like you like said there, it's almost having setting the boundaries with yourself. And but understand that the boundaries are coming for a bigger purpose. We can get to that in a second, that vision, vision value, purpose. That's a big thing what we'll actually talk about. But as you said there, I love the fact of it's controlling the things you can control. Because I think, like you mentioned, again, I know with top-end CEOs and stuff, that they're very most of them, I would assume, are aware of this. But most people on a day-to-day basis aren't aware of the things they can and cannot control, which is what causes them so much turmoil. Because what they're doing is they are that they're not aware of what's going on they've got so many decisions to make but they haven't got a framework to kind of run their decisions through so what they end up doing is doing nothing which is why people have got so many things i want to do this i wish but they then end up doing nothing because quote unquote they've got so much stuff to do when actually if you get them to write it down a piece of paper this is what i do my class right right, what can you can control what what things here can you oh oh, actually half that list you can't control okay so just get it out of the way and now with this stuff here right what order does it need to be done in because it's kind of like a logical order. But as you said, it's that framework of how you filtering through all of these decisions, which I think most people lack, which is absolutely fascinating. So let's just then talk about this um, th- this work with dads, because I want to go into dads and then go into the visions, values, and purpose, because again, I think that ties in nicely. So why specifically do you work with dads? Now, I know the obvious question is because you're a male and you are a dad, but was there any other reason why specifically working with dads? Yeah, so for me, the story would have been kind of coming out of, sport or in a performance company where clients were were brought to me you know athletes say look you don't get to pick your your coaches you know they're like parents you just you just get lumbered with them basically so um what happened was around november last year on a saturday morning my my daughter was just screaming at me basically saying look it's it's a saturday why are you not why are you not playing with me and i think at that point i was probably on my phone, looking at LinkedIn, trying to connect, trying to message somebody. And I just thought to myself, look, this isn't really what I signed up to do. Firstly, in terms of being a dad, and secondly, in terms of being a founder and, and trying to, to push something forward. And I thought to myself, wow, there's probably loads of dads out there that are going through exactly the same process. And for me, one of our kind of founding lectures of being a you know strength and conditioning coach or a coach will be, needs analysis so the idea is that you could go I could go and work in any sport because I would be able to go out and do a needs needs analysis look at the research speak to coaches watch the sport speak to players and and, and build up an understanding I was like right that's what I need to do so the research there's not much out there so what I was like right so I went off 
or am now I'm over 65 business dads that I've gone off and interviewed and, and said, look, what are your challenges? What are your frustrations? What's your biggest fear? So that I know where my challenges and fears lie and if there's any similar kind of similarities and looking at me as a coach and saying, right, what am I lacking? Because what one of the biggest, I know this will go maybe not down a different tangent, but when when coaches go off and we learn models and methods and then we force that onto people it just doesn't work sometimes it will sometimes it won't so that's why my biggest philosophy or, or something I learned from from a really good coach was like you know you want to try and fit the exercise to the athlete not the athlete to the exercise and that's where with my coaching that's what I think about now I'm like right I'm trying to fit the model or the framework to the individual that that they get it and they understand it mm-hmm. and so that kind of led on to this right you know working with with dads in business that they're trying to to get their company to grow and you know they they need that financially but also from a success point of view from a confidence point of view you know create an impact however they determine what their purpose is for that but also that you know they're trying to be a, a, a big dad because from a from a developmental point of view like 10 and under is a really big time where you're forming your relationship with with that that individual your your child basically and what i see is a lot of dads is like right they're all in the business in hope that they can get enough income and and get the business to be successful so they don't have to be so much like in the business they can be on the business so they can step away and, and do that and then spend time but then they then your kids are kind of teenagers and they're probably off doing their own thing and socializing with other people and you've kind of missed that so for me it's like right how can I support them and, and create like a pathway or a framework where they can always come back to and, and rely on basically mm-hmm. thanks a lot uh, one thing that stuck out stuck out my mind there is fulfillment and almost like asking them like why are you doing what you're doing so I think as you saw mentioned there a lot of people are so blinded by quote-unquote success which again we'll talk about in a second like what actually is success it's all relative but they're chasing this success but if you ask them what do they really want, it would actually probably be to have a good relationship with their kids. But as you mentioned, they, they want this thing so badly. They're so blindsided. They've got like the tunnel vision and they don't have that sense of fulfillment because they're working all the crazy hours trying to chase success. When actually for them, all success might be is I get to spend evenings with my kids. So they, they think success is the money. They've got all the money, but actually they're really unfulfilled. And again, uh, I swear I've been blessed enough to speak to a few millionaires in my time. And again, they've always warned me it's not about the money. And they've all said the same thing. They said, I know it's really easy for me to say because I've got all this money, but it's not about the money. And this one gentleman, he didn't have any kids, but he basically just looked at his wife and said, all I care about is my friends and my wife. He said, that for me, like that's all that's all I live for. So the money, you could take it away as long as I've got these guys, I'm happy. And isn't it interesting how most of us kind of lose sight of the purpose, especially as a dad, I imagine. I don't have a child, but as a dad, I imagine it's like all they really care about is the children. Yeah, they're the ones that are suffering for this thing that they think is going to bring them the success. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. You, you, you know, it's it's be careful what you think, and what I mean by that is what you are thinking. Who is creating those thoughts? So we have to be so careful with what we read, watch, view, see, speak to, because that can that's formulating, you know, our conscious thoughts. Whereas really, you know, what are our unconscious thinking? What And that's where kind of like, right, stepping back and having a little bit of whether you want to call it spiritual work or introspective work, however you want to see it as. Because, yeah, you know, I remember delivering a workshop in Japan and the senior guy stood up and he was just, you know, in tears. And that's quite a big thing in Japan from a male point of view. And he was just saying, look, you know, my daughter's 12 and she just said, look, I don't want your money. I just want I want you basically. And I've always wanted you. And there's some great research out there where it looks at amount of money that you really need to be able to be happy. And, you know, if you times it by, by two, you wouldn't be doubly as happy basically. Mm. And I think there where a lot of the business dads I speak to, it's like, I'll be happy when I'll be happy when we get this, you know, I'll be, and I'm sure you've seen it as well. I'll be happy when I'm at this weight or I can lift this much weight I'll be happy when, Mm. and all we're doing is we're just delaying our happiness because, you know, we, we could talk about the the benefits and negatives of goal setting, but, you know, 
one of my ex colleagues is a mountaineer and she she kind of has spoken to a lot of people and you know people who climb mount everest you know that's their greatest their peak experience but then it's followed by kind of like a, you know i've done it now what, what am i going to do i'm i'm lost i'm mm-hmm. completely lost so and although lots of people will say to you right enjoy the journey be present etc cetera, etc cetera, it's really trying to make sure that you you know you're engaging with with what you're doing basically hmm. so how do you go about that then because this is an interesting thing so for me uh again I, I think we work very very similar ways it's again be very careful of what you're consuming like what you're thinking but more importantly it's a subconscious programming because that's going to determine what you're sort of getting if you don't think you're worthy you're not gonna, you're never going to be worthy but again i i'll be happy when one of the things i try and get my clients to speak about or teach them is the power of gratitude to be grateful in the moment to realize that again happiness is a feeling and people think they'll be grateful when they're happy when actually it's the other way around like you gotta be grateful first because gratitude is the precursor to being happy so people again placing their happiness externally when actually happiness is a feeling which is internal so actually teaching clients to be happy now even if they're not where they want to be because as you sort of mentioned i'll be happy when i get x okay well x could be a car cool well if you don't like yourself and you're not happy with yourself when you have this external thing you're still going to hate yourself you'll just be driving a really nice car so it's like actually people have got it kind of backwards and i think that's that lie we're told you you need this you need this you need this and actually all you need is to back yourself if that makes sense yeah, you know, and it's how, how do you go about doing that? Because that's an interesting thing. How do you work with clients on that? Well, it, it really gets to a little bit again, ultimately is digging deeper to what they what they want for in, in for their success, you know. So and it and it takes time. Um and it, it's kind of a bit of a step away that people are like, what you mean I don't need to be hustling and working all this time? I don't need to be earning X to be deemed a success so how you define your success and how males define their success is, is a really interesting process again and it's like right who is defining your success that's that's for me is is an is a question that i'll ask clients and you know people are coaches like right who's defining your success and a lot of people's success are not actually them it's it, it's something that they've you know they they see and that you know they look up to basically so it's for me is to get back and think and there's loads of science around you know the the benefits of gratitude or a gratitude practice but really you know morning routines etc cetera, etc cetera. but for me it's like right to take stock and just think to yourself well what what's going on here and and you know how how grateful i am because if you think about it a lot of problems we have you should actually be quite grateful for them you know mm. in in certain as, aspects because there's people around the world that their problems are way more, <laughs> you know, you know, we're sat here on a podcast on, we have internet. We, we, we're quite, we're quite lucky and fortunate basically to be able to, to do this. And what happens then is that to shifts you from being this emotional human being to actually more of a rational being. And that that's the key, you know, the emotional brain is, is a great piece of equipment, you know, as a father, it will allow me if my daughter or my son is in danger to, to just react and, and just not think about myself completely, you know, jump in front of a car, whatever it might be. Obviously, rationally, in my head, if I start to think rationally, that's not really a good idea for me to do. But that's the kind of thinking. So how many decisions when we go back to that decision making, are you making from an emotional point instead of a rational point? Mm. You know, you go to the fridge is it a re- is it emotional decision or is it a rational decision that you're 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 choosing to eat what you're choosing to eat mm. hence the reason why most people you know eat rubbish in the evenings because they're tired they're fatigued the willpower is not fine out you know and especially when you're tired it's easier to make emotional decisions that's why people who don't sleep enough for example overeat you know that there's studies out there that look say that they you know, they roughly eat around an extra 350 calories a, a day because they're, they're tired. And that's because you're, you're driven emotionally to a certain degree. I think, you know, what's like, if you haven't, if you haven't been sleeping well, 
your relationships st- st- suffer you know mm. with your with your friends and family it's, it's quite simple my mental health takes i've mentioned this a few times on the podcast if i have two bad nights sleep in a row my mental health takes a nosedive like i'm very aware two days is my max of bad night's sleep and i'm just diff- literally a different person like i just it's, it's bizarre how much it affects me uh this is a massive thing because i was talking to someone about this for the weekend actually um and he's a successful business person and he mentioned about success and he was talking about i said to him oh do you have this company all over and he says oh it's quite funny you mentioned that because people judge success in my industry on how many cities you're in but actually that spreads me too thin and he then had to talk about, about the ego and he says yes it'd be really nice for me to send me in all these cities but actually i'm really good at what i do because I, i'm just in one city and i'm very very good at that and i'm expanding in that one city and I thought it's a really interesting thing as guys that like we're very like ego driven and it's like we want to be the best to again somehow prove our worth, which again, where's that come from? Normally it's from not feeling good enough as a child. But then linking back into that with the ego and the decision making, when it comes to an emotional point of view, do you find that a lot of the guys that you work with are really bad at emotional management? Because typically what I've found in what I'm doing is that guys aren't as good at identifying and communicating their emotions, whereas women are. Again, very stereotypically here. I'm not saying it's always the same, but guys tend to not express their emotions as well. Yeah, I think that the research for me is naively starting in January and thinking, oh, it's going to take me two months to get 50 guys. And it, it took me six and a half months because men just, we just don't talk. We, we, we're we kind of like, right, we've got this, you know, I saw a podcast, well, not a, a, it was on Instagram and it was this guy like, you just got to be a warrior, you just got to be a warrior. And I'm like, yeah, there is a, you know, if we look at the four archetypes of men, a warrior is is one of those those strings. And whether it's ingrained from us as a kid, you know, like big boys don't cry, you know, don't show your emotions, man, man up, up, yeah, you know, all this, you know, have a concrete shake, you know, all this kind of stuff, basically. And obviously that, you know, that kind of feeds into it, and there's this whole kind of discussion around vulnerability as a leader and, and whether you should show vulnerability. And for, for me, yeah, you should, should show vulnerability, but it's making sure that you show it at the right time with the right people. Mm. And that's not to say that you, you hide stuff, but that's to say that you're enabling yourself to go off and, and express it at the right time. Because mm. when something is going wrong in a, in a bad situation and your family are looking to were you or your friends, you, 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 you know, even though vulnerably inside, you're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, you have to control that emotion. But at some point, you've got to, you know, let it out or or speak to somebody. And that's where kind of Gabby Mate's work when he talks about trauma. So he's I love him because he talked, he said, like, trauma is not what happens to you. It's, hap- it's what happens inside you. Mm. So. So, you know, we we kind of. We, we walk around and we, we don't really understand what's going on. So when, when I speak to people, I say, right, what's the three big rules for being a state agent? And everyone's like, what do you mean? And it's like, well, it's location, location, location. And when you're coaching, the three big rules is context, context, context. And what I mean by that is you have to understand that you don't understand what's going on in that, in that person. And I think that <clears throat> that's a big learning when, from a CEO point of view, and even from a performance point of view from an athlete, is that if you understand the context of the people around you and what's going on in their lives and how it's affecting them, you you then have a much better understanding of how to how to you know spread that load or or get them to work or put them into teams. And you know, people talk about man managers in especially in male football, you know, are these the, this manager is a great man manager. And all it is is that they understand the player they understand you know their wife their family their kids etc cetera, etc cetera, what's going on mm. basically and i think that's a big area where <clears throat> you go you go off and do the work on your own mm. and allow your allow yourself some space to to be emotional to to whatever it whatever however you express or manifest that mm. emotion it's, it's really and interesting to that yeah. someone just popped into my head there when you said that is have you seen that documentary on alex ferguson I haven't, no. So, again, I'm not a Man United fan, and I used to absolutely hate Alex Ferguson's complete transparency, but I watched a documentary because I just thought it'd be fascinating. And something he mentioned there was that he was meant to be like the best man in management ever, whatever he said. And he basically asked that question. And he basically t- his answer to it was, no, I just understood my players. 
So it says people are making this big thing. And he went, I just understood my players on an individual level. I understood about their families. Literally exactly what you described there. And that's Alex Ferguson, one of the greatest managers arguably of all time. And I was just like, no, no, I just actually cared about my players. And that's the difference. Like yeah. I knew all about them and what they needed and what they wanted. And people are now trying to make it this big thing. And he just in one sentence was like, no, it's just understanding my players. And it's just exactly yeah. what you just explained there. It's like, no, no, there's a time and a place for it. And I think, you know, uh, it wasn't only his players. It was also staff at the training grounds, you know, his 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 personal assistant, like everybody. He understood that for Man United to 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 be work to do well and to consistently sustainable performance, that it was a holistic approach of everybody is pushing in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that interaction with the the catering staff or whoever's making the breakfast, you know, that that first interaction when the player comes in is important, you know, and 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 that's the same as how we would look at business leaders and and right making sure that you know everyone in the everyone in the whole office you you know the cleaners the it people you you but you don't just you know kind of br brush over it you 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 know them and you learn them so how much power does it say when you know you walk in and you're like right i know hi bob how's your kids mm. ben and max for example that guy's like wow okay mm. now does it does it guarantee that Bob's going to go off and work even harder or do a better job? No, it doesn't. But it, it kind of builds that culture of like, look, we, we understand each other and we work each other. Work but, even then, each other. but even then, I, I would say that it does almost guarantee that he will <clears throat> do a better job because you're saying, you're basically saying, I hear you, I see you. And even just for a second, even if he doesn't like you, if you've just acknowledged him and his kids, he's like, oh. So you've just made him feel a little bit happier. Again, if he's just a little bit better at work because he's a bit happier, then it has that knock-on effect. And it's just how you make people feel. Like, people don't care about what you say. It's how they, you make them feel. And the fact of, as you said, if someone like Alex Ferguson is basically saying, calling sort of like the cleaner and saying, literally mentioning the person's name, that right there shows that I see you, I hear you. And that person is going to feel part of the whole rather than just feeling like a little bit of a cog, which a lot of people do do in big organizations. So again, I think it's a massive point you touched on there. Now, again, I knew we'd do this and I love this. Like we've gone off on massive tangents. I want to kind of loop it back into kind of the work that you do. But I'm just really interested because you mentioned earlier on about the research that you're doing, interviewing uh, high-performing dads. Uh, and you mentioned that you're basically trying to figure out what their fears are, challenges are, and obstacles. I'm just wondering, are there some sort of common things that are coming up that you're noticing that all dads kind of have? Yeah, so the three big ones, you know, time, or this feeling of lack of time comes up nine times out of 10. Um, so, you know, one guy calls it the drug, the juggle struggle, you know, in terms of juggling everything and struggling to juggle, every, to juggle everything. Um, the next one down would be kind of lack of an ability to be present or what I would call engagement. So, you know, this feeling of, of just, you know, lost in terms of where they're at. And then the last one is, and we touched on it briefly is like, defining success so business dads heavily define their success from how well the business is doing and as we've just touched on there that's an external measure to a certain degree we we, we can influence how well a business is going to do but unfortunately you know looking at we didn't know there's going to be a pandemic we didn't know there's going to be a war with energy crisis and that's external to, to what we're what we're doing basically mm. And then the next step down would probably be kind of decision overwhelm. And then it gets a little bit touch points on those two. But those are the big three that kind of come up all the time. So uh, is your all work around um, defining and like, identifying people's pillars? Is that linked in with this? Like, is that is that what you can do? Do you kind of get like all these problems and do you sort of get people to look at their pillars in life and then kind of yeah, so work it off from there? What we would do is let's say most people I find have four pillars or five pillars. So you know, there are business, for example, you, I don't know, your business founder, you might be a partner, you might be a podcaster, and you might be a, a, a another, basically, a, you know, a, a, a fitness person, whatever it might be. And they're, they're kind of your, your pillars. Now, if I relate back to kind of stuff in, in Switzerland, mm. there's some big mental challenges for people who have top jobs, because let's say, for example, you're a CEO of a, a big financial institution. Well, 70, 80 hours, you spend in that job yeah then what happens is you lose that job you just say look you're, you're no good you're out you're done and then you've spent no time with your wife or partner you've got no relationship your kids don't really know you your health's not really where it should be and you you've got no friends because all your associates are, are 
are under the guise of, of your job and things then from a mental point of view can can go down really fast so what we're trying to get you is that to say look whenever you're in those pillars you're in those pillars you are engaged you're 100 percent focus you know it's so annoying for me when i go to the gym and i'm like looking around and i just see people on their phones or what i'm like look and then they complain that they're not achieving their goals or they're not moving on physically and i'm like well yeah because you're you're not really in it and 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 right i'm in the gym for an hour i'm gonna be in it for an hour so then i go from a business point of view it's like right when you're a founder you, you're in it you're in the business you, you're 100 focused you, you know you're selfishly not thinking about your your kids or your family because you're you, we know that that's the biggest thing that you're trying to do then then likewise when you come home you are the dad you are dad you, you you're engaged you're 100 percent focused on, on what you're trying to do and this is where you know gary neville touched on it on uh, on another podcast where he's like his daughter is just like dad you know you're here but you're never here as in you know you you're you're always thinking about something else you're not really thinking about what we're doing and for me when we look at lack of time is not the issue it's 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 more i'm not so concerned about time management i'm more concerned about energy management mm. so it's making sure that you have energy when when you need it the most and and that is where like that feeds back down into like our foundations you know eating sleeping you know moving thinking all those areas basically mm. that's a big thing i, I did a my, my analogy with that is i use a rubik's cube to basically try and say like you've got like six you say four pillars i've got like six sides and basically people are trying to find balance and you can't find balance in life. Like you can only really see a maximum of three things at once, but even the one at the top isn't going to have the same thing. So if you've got a busy deadline or something at work, that has to come first. But if your child gets ill, then that's the only thing you're going to focus on. And people talk about, oh, I need to find balance, like work-life balance. And then again, for me, I don't believe there's such a thing as work-life balance. Because as you said, like when you're at work, you're at work. And when you're in life, you should be in life. So it's not necessarily finding a balance. Like you should be 100% doing what you're doing. That makes sense. It's like, again, yeah. uh, when I interviewed Stephen Warnock on the podcast, he was saying how when his mental health was really struggling, he'd be playing football games, but his mind would be elsewhere. So he's not there present. So how well are you can perform as an athlete when your mind's wandering, thinking about other things? Again, as a CEO, you've got big, big decisions to make. How good are you going to be making decisions if you're worrying about something that's going on at home? Or it's just really interesting that people don't tend to think about this and people think they can multitask. Whereas I'm sure, you know, the study show, you can't multitask. You're just focusing on one thing really quickly and then swapping and changing which means you're not really giving your energy and effort on anything yeah so when i talk about people to people with you know work-life balance it's like imagine you know you've got a balance beam with a swiss ball on top of a swiss ball and then they're stood on top of it and they think that balance so yeah you might be able to balance for a second but at any point that's going to be knocked out so I think that people are then worrying about so much about balance and oh da, 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 da. and you're like, no, no, it's it's okay to sometimes bury yourself in work and 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 go for it. But you need to understand when that's that's become a bit too much of a bigger pillar, basically. So then how do I kind of step out? So what I'm saying there is kind of get people to come back into those different pillars and then be engaged like from my research you know the, the best business dads are like yeah you know I, I don't just spend time with my kids I'm 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 in it with them you know I'm playing with them I'm building lego we're painting I'm playing football with them I'm actively showing my kid that nothing else is is being thought about because that's the way it needs to be basically. And it's, it's a challenge, but if you, it's like anything, if you start to practice it, if you start to practice focus and removing distractions, and this is where this hybrid working or working from home is a big, big challenge, especially for dads, because, you know, let's say, you know, you take your kids to school. Fantastic. Love it. You know, you can switch off, you can be with them, and then you come back and then you're working and then they get back at three, four o'clock in the afternoon and you're still doing bits. I'd love to know a dad who's able to not hear his kids shouting and screaming and not for one moment start to get pulled into to that. And even if you haven't got, you know, kids and you're in the business or whatever, you know, the doorbell rings or something else happens. Or blah, 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 and we know that we, we kind of, 
you know we don't multitask we switch between tasks and that kind of small switch you know is kind of cognitive residue that causes and over the course of the day you spend your life just switching from one thing to the next hence the reason why you get to five six seven o'clock at night and you're like i don't think i've actually achieved anything today mm. Uh, do you, by the way, this is absolute gold here. Like the stuff you're giving is like, I think a lot of people need to hear this. Like I said, and it's not just about dads, like people in general, because again, there's a lot of lo- working mums as well that are basically stuck in the same. Yeah, position. so mums, mums are exactly the same. I'm not saying, mm. you know, you know, and the, the the challenge they have is sometimes it's not necessarily the opposite way around. But you know, I'm a mum first, and then I'm then I'm you know their pillars, mm. and it's like right, well, and fair play to them you know it's it's a it's a huge challenge and and the the big three things that you know when we look at when we break context the context down is like you know everyone's busy please nobody i've never met anyone in my life being like no i'm not really that that busy at the moment everyone's got shit on basically the next thing is everyone's got problems and the last thing is but everyone's trying to do the best they can with the skill set that they've got mm-hmm. and once I start to think about that, you know, when you see somebody kind of, I don't know, cause conflict against you, if you run through those tick boxes, you're like, right, so they're really busy. So probably not sleeping well, health wise, da, 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 et cetera. You know, they've got problems. We don't know what their past history is. You know, if they're going through some trauma at the moment or they've still got unresolved trauma, but they're trying to do the best they can. So let's give them a bit of a break. Now, if everybody went around like that, you know, we would be kind of in a much better world and we would Mm. kind of more have a better synergy. You know, living in London, how often do I see people just fly off the handle, you know, because I don't know, the train driver did this or did that, you know, or whatever it might be. And you're like, well, he's just he or she is just a face. Mm. You don't know what's going on upstairs. And this I think is a big area of where mental health is coming to the forefront and needs to be discussed because there are lots of people out there that we just don't know, you know, how many people, unfortunately, you know, end their lives and people around them saying, didn't know anything was going on. Mm -hmm. He or she was fine to me. And, and there's still some stigma and Jimmy Carr, again, he he's got some great stuff out there because obviously he's gone through it and, you know, depression is, an imbalance of your chemicals in your brain you know and he was he puts into a great analogy you know you don't walk around and somebody's got cancer and you just turn around to them and say you know toughen up we're like no wow they've got cancer but depression is you know it's an illness and it needs to it needs to be kind of supported and we just yeah we don't we don't do it that well especially for males we're awful I could be agree. I think one of the biggest things as well is uh, one of the biggest things I say, especially when I speak in schools and and, and I talk in organizations about this that topic is that you are the only person that can help you in that situation. And it's something that we're not taught about. So especially when going to schools, it's kind of like what you said to earlier on. I I try and arm people with the tools so that they can apply what they need to when they need to use it, rather than trying to be like, oh, just do this. Like journaling, for example. Don't force anyone to journal, but it's a tool that people can use. Again, the exercise is a tool people can use. Uh, Again, just talking to people. there's, There's so many tools that people can use, and it's giving people the tools before they need them. Because when people start to notice their mental health declines, especially as men, we're kind of just like, oh, kind of just well i know that i did and again most people just like, oh, put it down and before you know it you're, you're six months down the line and you're really really struggling but you don't know what to do so at least you've got some sort of tools there where you start to notice and feel a bit mm, you can you know what to do with it and i think that's the biggest thing people don't know what to do uh and again it's a sad thing especially again as a pressure of being a dad you're trying to provide you're trying to be a really good dad but you feel like nothing you do is good enough you feel like all the, the, the time to get away from you and i think that's one of the biggest things again same with mums as well like because again it's not specific to dads but that's what we're talking about today it's that pressure can feel so overwhelming mm. that you just feel like a failure and again the man is meant to provide quote unquote that's what we're always told so if you're then not providing if you're not feeling strong and stoic then you're a failure as a man and then that then compiles yeah. onto the top of it and then before you know it that's when dark things happen um so let's move on from this because again, that that's a, a, that's a whole other hour topic. Uh, that again, maybe I'll get you back on talk because it's a fascinating topic that I uh, discussed quite a lot on the podcast. I just want to talk about your pathway. Uh, we kind of touched on it earlier on, but I just want to loop back around to it. So when you're working with people, you mentioned that you work on their vision, their values, and their purpose. Uh, again, yeah. I think these are big things, uh, especially when it comes to the vision side of things and purpose. Uh, talk about mental health, which is why it's a good little segue. Uh, when I was at my lowest, I realized that I had no vision. 
and I didn't feel like I had a purpose. So I think this is a massive topic that people need to sort of uh, maybe take some notes on on this. So can we just talk about vision, value, and purpose and how you help people define all three in their lives? So, uh, you know, so <clears throat> overarching is the the vision. So where do you want to be and who do you want to be and, and what are you looking for, basically? And it's, her, you know, there are it's out there it, it, you know everyone's talking about it all the time but for me it's it's to get clear so when we come back to like if we say no to something the reason why we say no to something is because it's pushing us towards our vision and, and we believe that's the right direction to go and that doesn't matter if it's not it's just something we need to do next is the values right so values are not just words they're actions and this is where if your actions are not matching your values there's a big mismatch and that leads to an internal conflict, a, a civil war, as somebody said to me the other day in, in terms of your head. And, you know, you can just see it. People who are acting their values, you can just see it in them. And then lastly, it's like, right, what, what do I feel my purpose is and, and how do I push for it? Now, we don't have to have, so I think Daniel Pink talks about in Drive, he talks about a big P and a little P in terms of like, we don't need to have this big purpose, like I'm trying to save the world. Or, or, but so... The smaller P is that. Now, from business dads, whenever we break it down, normally that purpose is to be a dad. It's it's not it's not to to sometimes be the big founder that you know from a social impact point of view. And what we do is, if once you start to have a discussion around all three, we start to see how they all kind of link in and, and support each other, basically. Um, and it could be a really interesting kind of process just to say, right where where do we want to be and how do we want to feel and what do we want to look like just just from that point of view and then once we've got that down it's like right where do we want to be in five years and we'll just re start to reverse engineer it basically to get to a point where right from a day-to-day -day point of view what are the things that we need to do to show up and push us and move us forward i think that most people are, are not patient enough to understand that those simple steps of you know the the one percenters you know james clear compound self-improvement are the things that actually really help and if i then switch it and people are like oh i don't understand but i switch it into like being a professional athlete well once you get to be a professional athlete you're not going to you know increase your performance by 10 percent, 20 percent year on year you know you're going to get small margins and that's where kind of what we should be looking for in ourselves but we you know you know, January's coming up. So everyone will be like, right, I want to lose this. I want to do this. I want to do that. And you're like, no, 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 just stop. What can you consistently do for a year? And then let's see what happens. Mm. I get that all the time. It comes to clients. I had uh, someone, they first signed up and said, oh, I'm going to train seven days a week. And I went, no, you're not. And you went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, no. I said, like, can you consistently train for seven days a week? And she went, yes, I can. And I went, I don't think you can. But I said, right, let's just knock it down to four. And I said, if, if in a month's time, you can still do seven, we'll go up to seven anyway got literally two weeks in and she went i'm really glad you knocked down to four so because we're because again business owner and, I, and so i knew for what you can't train seven days a week like you're going from zero to 100 i said let's just go to four i didn't get so four consistently she hits and i actually ended up knocking it down to three or four whatever feels right as you sort of said it's you're giving the person the flexibility but people just think they've got to do this big massive thing and they just get that overwhelm and as you mentioned it's not about doing just one big thing it's about doing the small things consistently but that's not sexy and that doesn't sell people think that again and this is why i, I love talking to successful people uh, again the person that's in the room with me today again very successful i, I enjoy talking to them it's, it's the basic small things that you keep doing that's what it is again look at the athletes they're not doing anything major they're consistently doing the small things they go and train as a footballer you, there's nothing you can't learn anything new you're just consistently getting better at passing and again, that's boring. People don't want, kids don't want to go and pass a ball for three hours straight. Well, that's how you get better. Like people don't want to do that stuff. But uh, again, Alex Hormozzi, he talks about it a lot. It's like people don't want to do the boring stuff, but it's the boring stuff that gets you the big stuff. And people yeah. just got it completely wrong. And as you said, January is a prime time to sort of actually see that panning out for everybody. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, I can't think, I'm trying to get extraordinary people do very unextraordinary things extraordinarily well. That's a quote from Jamie Will from the flow, 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 flow state, basically. And he was just saying that, you know, that's, and I've noticed that now, if I look back and all the best athletes, you know, they would do warm ups extraordinarily well to the nth degree. And 
they understood that process mm. i think that's that's what we need to be thinking about basically mm. what's that what's that saying that like you you you've got to practice how you play and again you look at the amateurs um because I, I was knocking around the, the non-leagues for a little bit uh during one of the lockdowns and basically the gaffer there said that a lot of these players technically uh they should be in a championship if not higher but their attitude's terrible they're not doing the little things they're not they're not practicing how they should be playing so they're not consistent but actually if they got their attitude right they'd be playing at the high level and that's the fine margins between like the non-leagues and the big leagues it's just actually being consistent and again people don't tell this to the kids like we're expecting this big magic pill or when you do this big this this, this one thing it's like that's not how it works it's like just small compound things over time builds up um so I then it, but just for those sorry yeah. just for those athletes that you know the ones then if you have a discussion about visions values and purpose you're like right once you dig down a little bit deeper, there'd probably be spots there whereby you'd be like, right, no, that won't work. Mm. So it, very kind of successful people, if we looked at them, they would have very similar kind of values in terms of what they're trying to do. And that's where, you know, it, it kind of spots it. And that's where I talk a lot to business leaders now about, right, how do I recruit? How do I get the right people into the company? Don't worry about skill set. It's like, right, let's talk about values and, and do, do they match the company, basically? That's what we're going to talk to you next, values. Because talking about values, because again, this is a topic that is thrown around all the time. People, it's like a, a buzzword, values. What are values and how do we know what people's values are? So someone listening to this right now, they're like, what are my values? Where do people start with that? So <clears throat> values are probably easiest. They're, they're actions that we do from a day-to-day -day point of view. Um, and... They're things that you stand for and that you you always do. So, obviously, if if I tell the truth all the time, then honesty is a is a is a high up on my, you know, my my list of values. If I believe a value of mine is hard work, and I'm showing up down day, day and I'm consistently putting in the work, that's an action that leads to to the values. And people talk about oh, you know, <clears throat> our value of our company is X, Y, and Z, and I'm like, that's great, but how are those how are they being formulated into day-to-day -day actions? And a lot of companies that I talk to, I'm like, I don't really mind what your values are, but I want to know what your anti-values are. So what things do you stand against? So, right, for example, bullying, right. That's a, And as soon as we see it, we're going to apply the biggest strain of, of, you know, we're not going to let anybody and any form of level get away with that, basically. And for me, I'm like, right, once you start to do that, you start to get into a point of like, right, okay, well, yeah, we want to be, you know, an open-minded company. That's one of our values, right? Well, do we encourage if we go back, you know, Bob the Bob the cleaner, for example, to allow him to step in and say, do you know what? I've just been on the office and I've noticed this and this and this, and we hear his comment instead of being like, no, you're not one of us. You're you're the cleaner. So that's kind of a big thing for me from a values point of view and then when we go back and we say right what are our own values making sure they fit into the company because the all blacks has been discussed the rugby union boys have been discussed all the time there's books around them and people they know their values and they know their expectations already as you step in to it and it breeds a culture of performance mm. and what you're trying to do is you're trying to breed a culture of performance in yourself but then also ultimately for the business dads I work with in their, in their household and in their company. So what I try to understand is with the leaders is that, you know, everyone talks about leadership. So we, you know, we talk about transfer transformational leadership and stuff. And I'm like, well, what can you bring that back into the home to, to help you push forward? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where kind of values really lie basically from, from my perspective. So it's like they could be doing. They could. Have, so my understanding of this is that they could have really good values uh, and actions at work, but actually when they come home, they're not congruent with that. So, like for example, like um, the big thing is like trust, but again, they, they, they don't have an open thing with their, their partner, for example, or um, the, the open communication is a big thing for them. Yet they're not communicating with their kids. They're shout. Is it little things like that where it's that causes the conflict because they're not being congruent with what they actually see? Yeah, yeah. So you know you rock up to work and you're one person you get home and you're another person and internally there's going to be that that fight of of you know your brain's going to be like right which type of person am i now okay so it, it's for me it's it's how do you 
how do you show up? So how do we set our state? State is really important. So state is the key to, to, to high performance. That's what no one really understands is like making sure that you're in the right state to go and do what you need to do. Um, and that's where when we talk about pillars, it's like, right, how do I get from one pillar to the next without carrying across? So, you know, if I had a, have had a stressful day at work or, or business is not going well, again, I don't want to put that onto my kid or my, or my, or my, or my wife in a way that's too stressful. You know, it's obviously good to kind of have open discussions about business and, you know, people need to know what's going on. And for me, that's like, yeah, that's understanding basically where you are and what you're, what you're trying to achieve. How do you change that state though? Because that's a really hard thing to do. Like if you're at work, you've got all that pressure on you. Because again, it's not just the pressure of running the company. It's the pressure of you're in charge of people's livelihood. So you've got all that pressure. How do you coach people to change that state? Because it's very hard. And again, you've, I know you've got like a car drive home, but even then it's like, it's hard to go from that to fun loving dad. Like how do you teach people to try and change that state? So... The, the drive home is an interesting one. It's it's massively important. You know, the commute with COVID, I think the commute is highlighted. Okay. It's not just getting home. It's not just a, a trip or whatever you want to say. It's like, right. It's an opportunity to, to, to decompress basically. So in terms of, we know that our, our physiology drives our psychology and our psychology drives our physiology. So it's making sure that physically we're in a, in a, in a good space. So, you know, how are we breathing? We, we understand that most people are bad breathers. We're, we're mouth to mouth breathers, or, you know, we breathe through our chest, I suppose, you know, all the kind of stuff from James Nestor, you know, and he's highly more articulated than I am about it. But what you can do is, you know, you can allow yourself that little bit of time to set, set yourself. So, you know, I, I, I breathe how you how you kind of end it you know whether you write down a little bit of a review you know right these are the three things what i do well what do i need to improve what didn't go well today and just kind of keep on ticking away from that and then kind of get into your head right okay look it's dad time now or it's wife time now or husband time whatever it is you know and it's no different to a athlete doing a warm-up before a session or before a game it's like right i, I need to switch into that state basically mm -hmm. and likewise when we go to work it's like right thinking to yourself right how do i want to show up what, what am i thinking about how am i breathing how am i walking how am i moving and all those types of things that that that, that bring that in basically so the general theme of what i'm getting here today of what we've spoken about is generally it's all about your intentions and being conscious about your intentions. So how you're gonna show up at work, how consciously do you want to show up? Like you're thinking about how do you want to show up and you've been very intentional about that. And then also when you're going back as a, as a, as a dad, you're consciously making the choice and the decisions and you're thinking about how do you then want to show up as a dad? Is that kind of in summary? I know, again, that makes it sound really simple and basic, it's not, but is that in summary, essentially what it boils down to, consciously being intentional about who and what you want to show up as? Yeah, definitely. It's, it, you know, and then we have huge influence over, you know, our intentions then about how we want to, how we want to be. Um, and lots of, when we, when we go through those three questions, you know, what I do well, what went well, blah, blah, most people will think from a business point of view, oh, you know, I had a great sales call here or that presentation didn't go well or this, this, and this. Very few people be like, right, what were my interactions like? how did I show up? What was my self-awareness like? You know, what was my emotional intelligence like in certain situations and how, and how can I move forward? Because one area that, you know, and it's interesting if we go back to Alex Ferguson, he was called a manager, but you probably want him people to be more of a leader. So I'd, you, yeah. And that's a, a tough challenge for, for founders go from, creating a company and basically managing everything and, and knowing what's going on and making decisions all the time to actually right stepping back and being a leader and allowing their employees or their staff or their people to to make the right decision mm -hmm. and then feedback to them when things go well and don't go well so from a decision making point of view it's like right how can i shift you know from from being a manager to being a 
to being a leader. And that's very similar to how from a business, from a dad point of view, is like, right, how can I shift from, you know, controlling or, or being a controlling parent to like, right, let them go off, let them, you know, fall out that tree or crash their bike or do whatever they want because ultimately failure is failure is an option and failure is the, the way that we learn, mm. basically. Lee, I've had, uh, honestly, it's been a fantastic conversation. The final question I want to wrap up with this is, um, it's one I always ask all my guests, but I'm just kind of linking it back to what we've been talking to. Um, what's one bit of advice you'd give to someone right now that is a parent and a business person who's feeling stuck and out of control? I would say that there's lots of parents in the same boat. So reach out, find out, find groups, find people who are struggling and 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 talk about it. Mm. Because, you know, mental health, as we, we, we touched on it, one of the easiest things, and, you know, you've probably experienced and I've experienced, the easiest thing is to not talk and just go in your own shell. And, and you know, I think that... Um, Paul Merson touched on it when he did his walk and he was talking and he's like, depression wants to get you on your own because it's like, that's when it can succeed. And I think that when you're thinking about struggles and you're thinking about different things, you know, it's to, it's to get that, get that tribe of people around you that are, have been there, done it, bought the cheesecake and, and, and willing to kind of help you out basically. That's I know that's probably, no, I know no, it's no. like, you know, it's not a definite like, yeah, okay, journal every day or do this or ice bath walks or cold showers, whatever it might be. But for me, it's like, right, once you reach out and you say, okay, you know, because everyone's everyone's kind of got struggles. Everyone's trying to do the best they can. It's just by sharing that, you, you're going to get in that shape and, and mind of stuff basically again, to help and you. It, and again, especially as a business person, people know the benefit of masterminds where you're sharing ideas anyway. So it's doing that same principle when it comes to mental health. So what struggles you've got, just share it and actually just get it out of there. I've never heard that quote from Paul Merson. Again, as a Villa fan, I'm ashamed that I've not heard that, but that's that's awesome. I I, I, uh, I really, really like that. The depression wants to get you on your own. That is very, very profound. So again, thank you for sharing that. Um, You're welcome. Where, where can people find out more information about you? If they want to, to work with you, find out more about you, where's the best place to get in contact with you? So LinkedIn is, is where I'm kind of, so obviously my name and you know I should pop up basically. So LinkedIn is is where I spend most of my time in terms of, you know the content that i put out there or you can just head over to www.cognitiveathlete.co.uk and if people want to reach out i'm lee at cognitiveathlete.co.uk and they can drop me an email I'm happy to chat with Amazing. anyone basically i get mikey to put all that on the the show notes together perfect That's thank well. you uh lee thank you very much for your time today mate you're welcome enjoyed it have a good christmas you too